thank you for uh, being with us for another ep uh, of the PIDES webinar uh, of the many that we've already held and uh, we will continue to hold in the future. This uh, in the PIDES webinar series, this uh, we we, were, it, we seek to uh, listen and learn from speakers, not only in Pakistan, <clears throat> but from around the world. And for a better understanding of the world around us, and also for dissemination of knowledge. We've <clears> had some <throat> prolific speakers, uh, and uh, some of them we've had Nobel laureates too in our PIDE webinar series. Today's speaker uh, is no exception. He, Paul Ormerod, is an economist. He's a prolific author, and he's also an entrepreneur. Uh, <clears throat> So let me just give you a brief introduction to Paul's work and uh, about Paul. Paul is, as I said, he's uh, an economist, he's an entrepreneur, and he's a prolific author. He's a visiting professor at the Department of Computer Sciences at University College London, fellow of British Academy of Social Sciences. <coughs> uh, in 2000, 2009, he was awarded an honorary doctorate uh, by University of Durham for distinction of his contribution to the discipline of economics. Since 2020, he has been chairman Rochdale Development Agency. He's also a partner in Volterra Partners, a firm that he set up in 1998. And he is also founder plus director in algorithmic economics. Uh, to just to gauge uh, Paul's uh, influence and Paul's, uh, uh, shall we say, footprint, the Financial Times, which is a respected uh, uh, they, it called it called Paul a paragon of innovative economic thinking. As I said before, he is a prolific writer. He not only writes columns, uh, he has his own blog, but he's also written a lot of books. Uh, three of his best-selling books uh, were Death of Economics, Butterfly Economics, and Why Most Things Fails. Paul, thank you very much for being with us. It's an honor for us. <coughs> Uh, so I hope I got uh, your introduction right, yeah. uh, and I didn't mistake anything. But anyway, please do go ahead and enlighten us with uh, what you have to say. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, and thanks very much for that introduction. I'm uh, I'm pleased to be uh, asked to give this presentation, especially as you say you've had uh, you know some exceptionally uh, distinguished uh, speakers. I think to to give an overview, um, although. Um, I'm, uh, I have been um, is critical of, of some aspects of economics. I wanted to be, make it clear from the outset. I think that um, economics has got great strengths. I'm not really. I'm not going to suggest that we overturn what's in economics, uh, but to suggest that the the world we're now living in poses some some really quite important challenges for uh, the conventional model. Uh, and in particular, the, if you like, the conventional model of, the, of, of optimization um, of agents, whether it's individuals um, or firms. But let me start off by being quite complimentary about economics. I'd say this is the current state of economics, and I feel that it uh, to emphasize its strengths. I think one important point, which we should never forget as economists, is that it's probably got what's the only general law in the whole of the social sciences, that agents react to changes in incentives. Now, of course, incentives can be you know, very wide ranging. They don't have to be uh, purely monetary, um, something which I think many uh, young economists these days uh, often forget. I remember uh, when I was as undergraduate, the textbook then uh, emphasized this point that uh, people don't just react to price, there are other incentives to which people uh, react, and it's not simply uh, monetary incentives. Um, but if you deal with um, people from a wide range of disciplines, which I do, um, you're struck by the fact that um, unless other, other social scientists, unless they actually have this insight, that many uh, phenomena are actually very difficult to explain, whereas if we look and see what are people's incentives in any given situation, it doesn't mean we can understand it perfectly, but it gives us uh, important um, insight. And I think there's no doubt that microeconomics of individuals and firms has made you know, huge scientific progress in the last 50 years. 
I mean, it's now 50 years since George Akerhoff and uh, Joe Stiglitz introduced uh, imperfect information and asymmetric information um, into, the, into economic theory. Uh, and since then, I think microeconomics now, now gives um, a much richer and more realistic picture of how um, agents, whether individuals or firms behave uh, than it did 50 years ago. Uh, but also in a practical sense, um, there's no doubt that economics does occupy and has done for many years, you know, a really dominant position in, uh, in public policy uh, making. Uh, we can see that. I don't know whether you've been following uh, you know, recent events in the UK, which have been uh, you know, rather chaotic, uh, but there, if you like, uh, economists have been um, uh, asserting themselves. In fact, I, as, as I'm speaking now, um, the finance minister, the new newly appointed so-called chancellor of the exchequer, as we call the finance minister in the UK, is given an emergency statement on public spending. And he's been uh, essentially compelled to do this by the reaction of markets and the reaction of uh, economists to uh, the policies of the new prime minister. So a great deal of policy is filtered through the lens of economics. But there is a criticism that economics um, is rather insular, that because of this, because it gives a good understanding of the world, because it occupies a position of great influence in the policymaking structure, that in some ways it's impervious to ideas from outside. And this was said uh, very clearly by uh, Vernon Smith, who received the Nobel Prize for his work in experimental economics in 2001. Uh, he put it very clearly and said, within economics, there's essentially only one model to be adapted to every application, optimization subject to constraints. He gives a list of constraints and then says the economic literature is not the best place to find new inspirations beyond these traditional technical methods of modeling. Of course, we may say he could afford to say that he'd just been awarded the Nobel Prize. But uh, you know, I think that's a, a, a view which quite a few people have. And more recently, um, Andy Haldane, who's just stepped down as chief economist at the uh, Bank of England, um, uh, he, he's written a paper uh, and he gives lots of evidence for this, that economics, especially macro, has been rather insular as a discipline, at least in comparison with other subjects. It's been rather impervious to ideas which have come from, uh, from outside, although within economics, uh, developments take place, um, but it's not been terribly receptive to um, scientific advances um, elsewhere. Um, but it's not completely impervious to ideas. And I think one which is, this is something which have, is of great interest to me and uh, the work that I do with computer scientists at UCL, um, they are much more receptive and some references here to uh, machine learning techniques and to big data. The Halvarian had a paper you know, nearly 10 years ago, 2014, in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. And there's a very um, interesting paper uh, more recently, um, again, in the same journal about machine learning and applied econometrics. Now, we might say, um, in a sense, that's, the, that's understandable, in a sense, because uh, machine learning algorithms I see um, I've always been you know, very interested in statistical and econometric analysis. Um, these, if you like, are natural extensions. You know, they are more powerful ways of carrying out uh, data analysis in many ways than uh, conventional economics. And the, uh, the, the second paper in particular, I would recommend it's very nicely written. Um, it's very clear. Um, about the, the advantages which uh, machine, machine, even though that's only five, year, that's five years ago, they've moved on since then even, but it's very clearly in a very good description of uh, comparing um, machine learning with more standard econometric tools. Uh, but there's, I think they are really sort of a natural, incent, uh, natural extension. But we're, not, we're not completely impervious to them. But I think this is the, this is the, um, the challenge that I see, what I might call cyber society, because the, the, the undoubtedly the massive, the great new phenomenon of the 21st century is, of course, the Internet, um, which is making massive changes to the way people connect, 
and to the way people behave. And I think we have to recognize this and try to build it into economic theory, um, that it does pose very substantial challenges to, um, if you like, the more traditional rational choice model of economics. So one, one, one immediate question is um, information gathering and processing. So um, if I, a couple of days ago, I know you, probably, you might call them cell phones. In Britain, we call them mobile phones. You might call them both, I don't know. Um, but I did a go, I just did, I Googled mobile phones and a Google search gives a, about 155 million responses. Now, that's clearly an absolutely impossible task to process them. Um, I simply cannot, I cannot gather complete information on that. And any information that I do um, is very restricted. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence to suggest um, that um, people really, uh, this, this, will, this is a trailing a point I'll be making shortly, um, about 50 or 60 percent of the time, people only click on the first one that comes up. And the first three absorb over 90 percent of all clicks. And very few people go beyond the first page. I mean, we might do as academics because we're looking for something very specific or you know, we're looking for something um, and we may go beyond that. But most people confine themselves to a very, very small number of clicks when they're trying to gather information um, from the web. Um, there's also the question of um, social influence. Um, to what extent we, an, an important assumption of uh, economic theory is that um, agents exercise their choices independently. Um, their preferences are stable and they make independent choices uh, based on the information set they face. And I think increasingly that's not true. And in fact, the example I've just given of a Google search is a good example. Um, I mean, Google keeps its algorithms um, secret and there's a you know, there's a substantial industry and in people trying to guess what they are and uh, influence uh, you know positions on the Google search pages for, for various things. But there, when when we do that, um, sorry, I think somebody's raised their hand up, and I'll take if you don't mind, I'll take questions at the end. Uh, now, if you don't mind, I'll go through um, my presentation. Yeah, um, please go through your presentation. Uh, the questions will be answered at the end. Uh, yeah, sorry yeah. for that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so. Um, when, when I click on, say, mobile phones, um, the first one which comes up, um, although we don't know the, the secret of, of, uh, of Google's algorithm for this, but we do know it will be heavily influenced by the number of people who've already hit that particular website. So my choice, my information, is already being influenced very heavily by what other people have done. So social influence is uh, an important, uh, important in, in the web. Uh, there's also um, the role, slightly separate point, uh, the increasing role of the people who are recognizing uh, the role of emotion in choice, um, even in financial markets. And a very good book, um, Andrew Lowe, he's not just a distinguished academic, but um, he's made like hundreds of millions of dollars himself, uh, you know, uh, operating on financial markets. So he has uh, real credibility in this, how we uh, understand the role of um, emotion. So increasingly, I would say, certainly in, site, in, the, in web based choices, um, that preferences are increasingly not fixed, they evolve. Other people influence what our preferences are. Uh, they're not independent, uh, and they may well not be transitive or consistent, precisely because of this, because I may have one set of preferences today, and I'm influenced uh, by what other people do, uh, and they evolve. So these are really quite um, important challenges. I mean, much of the world, much of the standard world, if I go into a supermarket, for example, I think it's reasonable to assume the standard model of rationality, you know, is a very good approximation to reality. So it's not discarding it completely. It's saying that there are increasing parts of the world where we need a different way of thinking about things. And I think I'm going to discuss these really um, quite quickly. I think one is the use of heuristic of rules of thumb of behavior 
rather than trying to optimize in rules. Um, networks and social influence. And then I'll say something at the end, something of great interest to me is how we uh, convert text into quantitative data, which is a very uh, big research subject. But here, I've got here what I think is um, trying to do if you like a, a four box of where the standard um, model of rationality applies and where we might need different ways of thinking. So going from left to right on, on that axis, uh, that axis, I've got the idea of um, whether the extent to which people are choosing independently, as we assume they do in conventional economic theory, and the extent to which I call it copying here, but the extent to which their choice or the preferences are influenced by what other people do. So that's, that's one dimension. And the other dimension going up and down is where um, attributes of the alternatives are easy to distinguish. And as we go down, they become harder and harder to distinguish. I think an important point is in, in terms of hard to distinguish, many of the decisions which we take with which have important consequences in the future um, are in this category. Now, if you're choosing, say, a pension scheme, uh, you'll only find out whether it's any good uh, when you retire. Um, if you're deciding, you know, who to marry, well, you know, that, you know, you'll find out, it'll take you some time to discover, you know, whether you've made the right choice. Um, so those are just sort of everyday examples. So we've got these, if you like, these, these classifiers. Now, in the top left-hand corner, where I say considered choice, that's where economic, that's where rational choice theory sits. But by and large, people are exercising their choices independently. And by and large, they can understand and gather information um, fairly easily on the, on the properties, the attributes of the choices which they face. And I think if we go back, let's say, you know, to the late 19th century, when um, when economic theory was first being formalized, that indeed was almost, there was always things like fashion where people are influenced directly by others, uh, but that was in sense the world that uh, you know, branded consumer goods were new, mass consumer markets were very new. They was the first time they'd ever emerged. Um, and so we could reasonably say in that top left-hand corner um, in say 1900, that almost all the world was in that particular box. And so that's how economic theory was developed. And that's essentially where we've kept it, even though increasingly, as I think as we move to the right, say through um, the social influence, um, we, we increasingly, it's, it's not, we're judging people, we're forming our preferences more and more directly influencing our preferences. Um, that's becoming a more important part of the world. And that's the direction of change. We're not suddenly going to go back. We're not going to abandon the internet. We're not going to abandon the new uh, connectivity of the world. And so we need to be able to say something um, about this. Now, just let's say about, about heuristics. There's a, a long history of this. And I think this, this paper by Simon, Herbert Simon, um, in, is 1955, is nearly you know, 70 years ago. Um, I think this is one of the most brilliant papers that has ever been written in economics, where he was basically the inspiration for uh, the whole of behavioral economics, although it took several decades after this paper uh, for the topic to try to, for, to emerge. Um, I mean, Simon was a, a brilliant polymath. He didn't just get the Nobel Prize in economics. He won the, the highest award of the American um, uh, Psychology Society. He was recognized for uh, he had great distinction in his awards in, in computer science. But he says, the task is to replace the global rationality of man, with a, I mean, you'd now say person in the West, certainly, with a kind of rationality, which is compatible with the access to information and computer, computational capacities that actually exist. And he was writing, let's say, in the mid 1950s. And he was really then saying, it's not. It's 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 a. It's really too difficult for people to gather and process information. There's so much already around in an optimal way. Uh, we need to think of how they might um, uh, behave. And so even exposed, he was arguing, it's often not possible to identify 
what would have been an optimal choice. I think that's the essence of what he was um, trying to say. And he introduced the idea of its changes of meaning in economics. He's, he introduced the idea of what he calls satisficing. So instead of even trying to optimize, it doesn't mean you're not interested, you're not acting in a self-interested way. It doesn't mean that you're not trying to be rational, but you adopt a rule of thumb, a rule of behavior, which gives satisfactory results. You realize, you know, in a sense, that's what the Google algorithms are doing. I'm searching for something and they come up with something and say, this, this, will, be, this will be pretty useful for you. These particular, these first three sites that come up. If you look at these, you'll, you might find out what you need to know. Um, the adopter rule of behavior which gives satisfactory results. And at some point, the rule will stop doing so and the agent will look for another one. So agents, in other words, use uh, reasonable heuristics or uh, rules of thumb. And there's an increasing uh, literature on this. Um, in fact, I was pleased, there's one of the leading thinkers here is uh, the number two person in this, um, uh, uh, of the authors here, Gert Gigerenza. Um, and who's worked extensively on this in, in recent years. And I was very pleased to see in the Journal of Economic Literature that uh, a recent issue, uh, there's a big article by him and his colleagues on this, which I would, uh, is very, very interesting. But let me just move on and think, well, what happened? What are the consequences? Supposing we say people are influenced by the behavior of others. What difference does it make to um, outcomes? And there's a very interesting um, experiment carried out, it's nearly 20 years ago now, uh, by someone called uh, Duncan Watts. He, he was a professor of mathematical sociology at Columbia. Um, he was then poached by Yahoo to become their chief economist uh, for you know, a massive amount of money. Um, and I think he's now, he's now back in academia. But he had a simple idea, he got uh, students at Columbia. He got a list of, he got a set of 48 um, songs um, by, uh, by bands, by groups, which were of, of, a, of a genre which at the time was popular among students. And these weren't very well known ones. Um, and at the time, uh, the idea that you could actually be given, you could be given for free music downloads um, was you know that that was that was that was a real incentive. It's not now, but I'm just going back 20 years in time. And he said, okay, we'll do this. So you can come in and you can listen to these tunes as much or as little as you want. And at the end of it, you can take away for your own use uh, the ones which you like, as, or as many as you want. And so he had people come in and just simply rank them and say this, and then, then he looked to see which the popular choices were, and he got. This, um, I've, I've normalized this so that it's equal to 100. These are the number of downloads of each of the 48 songs when people come in independently, choose, and then leave. But we can see there there's one which isn't very popular, and the, but by and large, uh, the ratio of, if you like, um, the, the most popular to the least popular is like three to one, something like that. That's when people are coming in and leaving. And then he, he repeated the experiment. Um, which each experiment he carried out you know, a number of times. But when, when, when the students entered, there was a screen which showed what people had previously chosen during that experiment. So it's exactly the same, except they had information as to what previous people, obviously the first person didn't, when the second person came in, um, he or she could see what the previous, the first student had chosen and so on. And the outcome was you know, completely different, you know, absolutely completely different. Um, we see that one, one or two get huge numbers of downloads relative to the mean, most get very few. And this distribution is much more typical of the ones that we see on outcomes which are uh, internet-based um, than the first one. The first one is, is typical of a more conventional market where social influence doesn't matter, but this shows the absolute dramatic difference that social influence um, can make. And I think um, in terms of the experiment, he looked and said, well, in terms of the ones which are popular here, the, really, the ones really at the top, in general, they were never very unpopular. And similarly, the ones which were not popular were never really at the top. 
but any other result was possible. Um, there was a very little correlation between um, the like, independent choice world and the social influence world. So it can make you know, a really uh, massive difference, which is why I think we need to be you know, thinking about how we build these into economic theory and take account of um, this sort of behavior, especially when we're looking at uh, choices on the internet. Like I say, uh, we, we do have models in economics. Um, we're, we're, we're aware of the idea that there are, there are fashion markets and they may look more like this, uh, the influence is important, um, but they tend to be, going back to my four box, um, economists tend to say, well, that's a small part of the world. Um, and we know that that's an isolated examples, uh, but I think increasingly this is, these become more and more important, much bigger part of everyday life uh, compared to what went on before. Let me move on and talk about, um, if you like, text as data. Um, and again, there's a very, um, it, very important article, again, in the Journal of Economic Literature, um, uh, which explains it very nicely. It's a very, very good article. It's, been, it's, it's, it's quite a technical one, but it uh, explains it. And they're saying, look, new technologies make vast quantities of digital text available. Um, so the information, see, text is information. And so we, we, as economists, we're used to dealing with data, with numeric data, and that's information. Uh, but you say, well, information coded in text, there's a huge amount of this, and it complements the tradition, the more structured, does say quantitative data, traditionally used in research. And um, a, 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 a substantial amount of work in uh, computer science has taken place in recent years as to how we actually managed to if you like, extract from digital text, how do we, how do we, how do we convert this um, into quantitative information? How do we change uh, text into, into data? Um, the relevant algorithms are readily available in packages like R and Python, which are freely downloadable. Um, and uh, algorithms to convert words and symbols, which they call tokens, how do we convert them into uh, quantitative data, and the algorithms to analyze the resulting data. So it's certainly feasible to do. It's not, um, this is not, if you like, um, it, you know, what the, the science is, is that the, it's advancing very rapidly, um, but it's perfectly feasible in a practical way uh, for people to um, use these particular uh, techniques. And let me just give one um, illustration. There's a, a, a lot of literature on um, how we might, you know, on the inadequacies of GDP as an indicator of welfare. Um, how, do we, uh, how do we take this forward? Now, I'm actually quite, I'm quite sympathetic to the concept of GDP. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it does actually try to encapsulate in a single number, um, you know, a massive amount of things, but it does tell us something. It does tell us um, um, how, you know, how well off people are. Don't we, we shouldn't be uh, too ready to um, discard it. Um, and, you know, there's work suggests looking at um, relationship between the surveys of happiness or well-being and GDP. Um, it's, I think it's now been resolved that even, even in high income countries, that um, more income makes people feel better off. Um, so there is, I mean, the, 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 you know, the, the, there are diminishing returns to higher income, uh, but there's still a correlation. So I'm not suggesting throwing away GDP, so I, I, I'm actually quite a, uh, a defender of it as a concept. Uh, but there is a substantial literature, substantial and uh, increasingly call it on policymakers, uh, certainly in the West, to say we should be looking at happiness and well-being, uh, you know, rather than necessarily GDP. So many theories um, exist which claim to measure this. And these are based on surveys in which people state their well-being. So this is going back, this is like um, seven or eight years ago, the British government introduced, um, and so the Office for National Statistics uh, you know, the state body which gathers data regularly now publishes 
uh, survey results in which people state on a scale of one to 10, um, uh, how they feel, their well-being, and it gets, it gets big coverage in the media. People like this sort of thing. And you say, well, people in London, you know, people in London compared to people elsewhere in the UK or in Scotland or whatever. Uh, and uh, the, but they're based on surveys in which people say, they're asked questions, um, how do you feel on a, on a scale, say, of one to 10? And they're sophisticated. Surveys are, you know, they're, they're sophisticated. Um, but I would say um, in online social media, this is where I'm going to uh, show an example shortly, uh, people reveal their well-being le uh, level. And so this is important for economists, I think, because we believe that in making choices, people reveal their preferences. You know, we, we, if, if, for example, you know, we, we're traditionally as, as, as stated and revealed preferences and we prefer the latter, doesn't mean we uh, completely dismiss the evidence of surveys, um, but as a hypothetical example, you know, if somebody says, I prefer Pepsi Cola to Coca Cola, uh, but we observe all the time that they buy Coca Cola, we say that's their revealed preference, that's got more weight than their stated preference, their actions um, speak louder than words. So I've got a paper here for anybody anybody's interested to look at when we're looking at uh, real-time measurement of um, economic welfare. And um, what we're actually, yes, um, just as a, as, a, as, a, as a sort of, um, a sort of brief introduction to this, until uh, there was, uh, there is a way of doing this, which, uh, I mean, you look at a body of text and you then look, you look for specific words where the emotional content has been established, if you like, separately. Um, that people carry out work and say, this particular word has a, you know, has a pessimistic meaning or an optimistic one or means uncertainty. And so there's a, there's a very large and, and very widely referenced uh, document, uh, Associative Norms for English Words, but you can see 1999, uh, well, in computer science, that might as well be the Middle Ages. Uh, it goes back, you know, things move quickly. Um, and it's not that it's not valid, but people did that initially and said, okay, let's take some text. We want to measure the emotional content of this text, or we want to measure the level of uncertainty. Well, we could take, say, we could take even, say, the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal if we're looking to try and measure uncertainty um, or to measure um, the state of economic pessimism or optimism. It doesn't have to be just in consumer markets. It can have important policy implications. Uh, but this approach has now been um, overtaken in machine learning analysis. Um, Algorithms don't count specific words from a pre-assigned list whose contents measured outside the text. They learn the emotion directly from the text is the way to put it. Um, and essentially, we could think of them as classifiers. So something that economists are familiar with, logistic regression, that's a classifier. You know, if you're saying, well, have you bought a car or not? That's a zero one. And so they're trying to classify, is this is this text pessimistic or optimistic? Um, is, is, this, is this particular paragraph or whatever? So in what we did, what I did with um, a colleague at UCL, um, we looked at a set of tweets and we got some humans to, we, we took a small sample and got some humans to label them as saying positive or negative. So we had a, a benchmark um, and we, we've measured sentiment um, say the, de the details are in, in the paper that I referred to, um, in London on a daily basis from 2016 to 2022. Um, I'll just finish on this because there are some policy implications. Um, I've got it here to January. I mean, we do, um, not, not that we sell a lot of them, but we do, sell, we do sell this. I mean, I can tell you what's happened since then. Now the importance that if you if you go to right to the left the, the, sorry if you go to the left hand side of the screen, this is on a daily basis. Now, there's a lot of noise in the data, um, but we can see you know patterns in it. Now the, the first bit I think is particularly uh, important because in a UK context, um, the decision to leave the European Union was taken um, in. Um, 
in June 2016 when we started. We started to collect this data shortly before uh, the actual referendum. And at the time, uh, there was a genuine belief in the Bank of England and in the, the finance ministry, the treasury, uh, that if there was a vote to leave, then there would be, and the treasury indeed published an explicit forecast on this, um, a very um, a sharp uh, recession that they predicted that by the end of 2016, if there was a vote to leave, which there was, um, unemployment would rise by half a million and there'd be a, a sharp recession. And as a result of this, uh, the Bank of England were contemplating at the time before the referendum, uh, raising interest rates because inflation was rising and they're mandated to control inflation. And as a result of this, they didn't. They kept in interest rates down. Now, if they had, you know, we, we, this series is available and it shows that um, there was, I can see it right at the very start, there was a dip of pessimism for two or three days. I mean, London itself, I should say, uh, did vote remain. So people were very gloomy initially, um, but then that soon bounced back. I mean, just, um, and so, but then see consistently through the rest of 2016, uh, people became more and more optimistic. Um, it, on the contrary, there was no sign in terms of individual sentiment of anything to do, of any sign of a recession at all, uh, on the contrary. And that's indeed what did happen to the real economy. There wasn't a recession. The economy continued, um, continued to grow. So there's a, a, an example of um, how this could be really used. It's not merely um, a, 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 an exercise which is interesting and challenging um, for you know comp computer scientists and people interested in this sort of thing, and it could have real consequences. And just moving along, we can see uh, the big dip. Um, well, that coincides obviously with um, the uh, the COVID pandemic of early 2020. Uh, but we see there how people's uh, sentiment recovered really um, quite uh, quite quickly from that. Um, you know, and the, after the initial shock. Uh, people were really quite resilient. So I'm just using this as um, as an example of the sort of things which can be done. We can take uh, we can take text in this case, uh, individual tweets, um, uh, where, where you can gather. You know, it, it, there's a Twitter make available on a free basis, a one percent sample. So in terms of sample sizes, this is big data. Um, you know, even in London, you're getting you know on a one percent sample, you're getting a million tweets a day. Um, in your sample. Uh, so um, it, it, it's feasible to do this sort of thing. So just if you like to, in, in conclusion, so we've got time for questions. Um, again, I've got to emphasize that the rational choice theory economy still works well in many contexts. We don't want to throw it away. And there've been major advances in that. Basic challenges in the parts of the world the parts of our, our human life where networks and social influence and emotion uh, matter. And that's rising, that's becoming more important as a result, and we have to address that. So to, to understand this, I think we do need multidisciplinary work. We do, we, as economists, we do need to collaborate with other social scientists, with network theory, with AI uh, and machine learning, um, and essentially, meet these challenges, the tools are there. Uh, and I think we just really need to uh, use them to best effect. So I've gone through quite a lot today, but these are things which are of um, interest to me in terms of how we might shape uh, and move economics forward um, over the next uh, 20 or 30 years. So if I could finish on that, I'll be very happy to take questions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Paul. That, that uh, was an excellent, excellent uh, presentation and um, an excellent presentation uh, uh, to the uh, literature surrounding our uh, preferences and uh, how they are shaped. Um, I, uh, before moving on to the floor, uh, if uh, anybody has questions, please please do raise their hand. Paul, I, I have a few questions if uh, and I'd like those to feel to you. The first, uh, I think you partly answered that, but uh, Britain's uh, exit from Europe, the Brexit, and yeah. um, then there were other events like Facebook's influence on elections. We heard a lot about the 
2016 elections in the United States of America yeah. and how uh, Facebook was used by, uh, apparently the, the, the accusation is that the Russians used it uh, to manipulate the sentiments of the people. So my question in that regard is, what's the implication for uh, democracies around the world uh, in that kind of uh, yeah. scenario? Uh, and uh, the second, would you like to answer the first one before I uh, go ahead with the other ones? I have two more. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I think I mean, that's obviously an important, it's a very uh, important point. Now, look, I mean, certainly look, all political parties, well, certainly in, in Europe, uh, certainly um, all political parties have now learned from this. And they, they use extensive campaigns on social media, extensive campaigns on Facebook, Twitter, and so forth. Um, so they've learned we can't we can't turn the clock back and uninvent it, um, and so people have learned uh, have learned to try and use this. Oh, I mean, all political parties, you know, they're not around the world. We always have to be skeptical about uh, what they say, uh, even in democracies, because they want to get elected. Um, I know I know there was there was concerns about um, whether the Russians had manipulated it. I think there is some work suggesting that that's really um it's it, it, it's an exaggeration there's no i don't think there's any really firm evidence that it was uh decisive in the results um um because there was you know there was a huge amount of of of, of, of other data around um it wasn't that it was you know swamping things um so i think you know it's, we the point is we have to live with this and we do know that there are, there are hostile powers um not just what the Russians, but um, you know, Chinese. We have to take account of that in the West, certainly. Um, and so, um, but we, as democracies, we have to learn to live with it and say the political parties are certainly adapted to it. Um, certainly in the UK and the rest of Europe are now using it just as extensively um, for the for the for their own ends. Yeah, Paul, thank you very much for this very nice presentation, and you have covered so many aspects and so many things in this one uh, presentation. So I have a bit technical question that yeah. you are mentioning machine learning, artificial intelligence and other things, and you are talking about classification and all yeah. that. So if you listen the debate between imbens and angry people, so we have a question why things matter. Whereas in, uh, you see business and computer science, we are, we are more interested in what does matter. So what's your take on that how machine learning and artificial intelligence and all these things are going to help economists to have better policy interventions because mostly we have good predictors or we can classify the things, but uh, what, uh, why does something matter? That that's a question is basically Thank you. I agree, that's a very important question. And the question, um, is really saying if we do say an econometric model, uh, then we have explicit explanatory factors and we can look and see what their influence is in the equation. We've got all sorts of tests as to whether we think it's a, a valid equation. Whereas if we use machine learning, we may get something which in a statistical sense is more powerful, um, but it's, mu it's, much, it's much less obvious as to what the influence of the different factors are. It's not, there's not an explicit functional form. I think I'd say on this, um, that there is, um, this is a, a really hot topic in uh, machine learning research. And I think you mentioned that there is some, which I just can't remember, mentioned Imbens, uh, but I think Susan Athley has done some work on this, uh, we know within economics, um, as to how you actually, uh, how to actually extract from what might be seen as a black box of machine learning, how you extract information to make it more comparable with econometrics. But all I can say is, you know, there's, that people are very conscious of this um, and there's a great deal going on, but I wouldn't say yet that it's a completely solved problem. But I might say, um, I think uh, just one final point, I do think um, it might be that, um, uh, we could we could take existing um, economic models and use those and see if because machine the machine learning algorithms are, are much better at finding nonlinearities, can we find those to make 
uh, better predictions. And I've I've done a, a few a few papers looking at uh, predicting financial you know, predicting economic recessions using financial variables. And it may you know it, there may be something there which would give us uh, more of an edge. But yeah, I mean it's not a solved problem, but people are you know very aware of uh, of the issue which you raise. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Paul for his uh, wonderful presentation. So I just have a question if uh, Sir Paul can uh, like just explain his area. That the recent uh, um, like the British government announced the uh, tax cuts. Yeah. And later, like, but they faced lots of criticism from the IMF. And um, now they have uh, reversed this decision and they are not like giving the tax cuts. But there is a debate going on um, in the newspapers that, um, that they, they, like the tax cuts could be like emphasized and there should be tax cuts in the uh, UK. So, uh, so can you like share your uh, thoughts on that if, if it's your area? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. No, sure. I mean, if I, yeah, if I could, I mean, that's, that's again, that, that, that's a very, very interesting question. I mean, if I could you know, perhaps slightly uh, generalize around this. Um, one of the reasons I think trying to um, track emotions, and we said I said, this can be, you know, don't do it in attitudes in, in, in serious papers, like, you know, outlets like Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, and so forth, is that um, the reaction to um, government plans um, is often driven by emotion on the financial markets, not necessarily by um, rational uh you know rational analysis and this is something which you've gone back um looking at say Keynes in his general theory um very few people read his original book these days um but he was very very emphasized enormously the importance of um psychology um in the way in which uh we the the, the financial markets in particular but also the economy itself could be driven and so to give an example, um, well, at the, the current time, uh, the markets took fright and there were tax cuts and said, well, well, the, first of all, the government, like in common with many Western governments, have introduced huge subsidies for energy prices, um, which I think it, it, I'll come on to back to that in a minute. Um, and so the, 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 the debt to GDP ratios had risen substantially because of the COVID pandemic, the support they'd given to businesses then. Uh, they're supporting energy prices, so debt to GDP had risen. But this had risen, you know, in essentially all the Western economies. Um, everybody was was doing it, and the tax cuts themselves were really quite small in comparison. And certainly, in an objective sense, the ratio of, debt, of public sector debt to GDP in the UK um, is not large. It's much less than it is, for example, in Italy. Um, slightly more than it is in Germany, but not much so, uh, very similar to most Western European countries. So that in itself um, is not an objective reason to panic um, and sell sterling and drive up guilt yields, but it did uh, because of the because of, uh, of the psychology. And there's another example going back in the um, in the previous decade in there were uh, quite a number of different crises in the euro of, of, of the euro currency um, and at the time uh, th there were several episodes in which uh, government bond yields in like Spain and Portugal um, uh, rose to seven or eight percent um, even though their debt to GDP ratios were really quite modest but again the sentiment turned against them so I think there's an element of that um, I think the way the government the, the government really um, uh, if I have just written a piece um, for uh, I do a regular column for an online newspaper City AM I've just written a piece um, earlier this morning to to to, to go off saying you know that they just got the timing they, they just the, the timing was wrong they just handled it very very badly um, and undermined confidence um, whereas I would say. There is evidence to suggest that um, tax cuts, you know, do, in the longer term will benefit an economy rather than uh, public spending. I think that's what some of the literature um, suggests. 
Um, but I think the whole episode illustrates to me, you know, the importance of economists, you know, it might be, it's a very, very challenging task, but at least we now have the tools to try and get a handle um, on this some sort of thing, rather than it occurring, you know, completely out of blue, which it, which it has. And I appreciate that's not a completely satisfactory answer to your question, but um, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an attempt. Thank you, Paul. That was a wonderful talk. Really appreciate it, just as I appreciated your books. But um, the question that arises to my mind, reading all this stuff, and especially your talk, you talked about how a connected world, basically, if I paraphrase one part of your talk, yeah. that in a connected world, we kind of have moved from the, um, so the, the leftmost quadrant that you showed yeah. to a much more complex situation where we are all inter interconnected mm -hmm. and uh, dependent on each other's information sets. Um, and you showed that in that world, the power law seems to obtain, that everything seems to flow into one direction. And in that kind of world, I mean, you know, in, in the old world where everything was rational and not connected, the, you know, you could have navigation, you could have industrial development, you could have people shooting forth. But in this world now, what chance do countries like us have, uh, the poor countries, in terms of being able to, to really catch up with the West? Are we losing that? Are we losing convergence? Are we going to have convergence in this world? And especially in this world where we don't even have the freedom to make our own policy, etc. So I'd like you to reflect a little bit from, um, on, on the development world in, in the context of what you were saying. Thanks. But, yeah, I mean, again, I mean, this this itself would be um, this could be a, 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 a talk all of itself. Going to what extent we might expect convergence? I think, um, in one sense, um, I think the the connectivity of the world is essentially is is actually helping convergence because um, knowledge, you know, is now not completely, but there's you know is readily available. There's a lot of like scientific advances become readily available. And so, you know, if your access to technology um, is uh, much freer than it's ever been. And so I think this gives the possibility of uh, the developing world to act to, if you like, to leapfrog and to access and start to implement, you know, the most advanced technologies uh, and, and to leap over. I mean, this is not, I mean, I know, I mean, this is just an example um, a well-known example, for example, I don't know whether it's happened in Pakistan, but certainly in uh, many African countries where it's like internal communications were difficult. Um, the, there were landline phones, but they, not, they weren't extensive uh, and unreliable. And so people have, have leapfrogged. And so instead of putting in inf extensive, inf you know, huge expensive infrastructure to, to uh, build landline connectivity by phone, people now use mobile phones um, and everybody gets them. That's, and this, that's, that's using the new technology. So it's not that, I, I, obviously I appreciate there, there are many, many other constraints, like you say, on, uh, on people being able to develop. But I think in some ways, the, um, the, this increasing connectivity and availability of knowledge, which, which can be readily shared, um, it does give me you know, some hope, some optimism um, that maybe the, the, at least it's, it's removing one constraint uh, on the way in which the uh, developed world uh, can, 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 can move. Um, so it, it, I say it does make me a bit more optimistic, uh, although as I say I appreciate that this is a massive topic, as you, you suggest, uh, that there are many, many other uh, many, many other, many, many other constraints. I hope that answers the question, uh, Dr. Nadeem. Uh, thank you, Paul. And uh, my last two questions, which I kept for the last before, uh, okay. we don't disturb you anymore. Uh, just, I was just wondering, uh, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned the uh, Herb Simon paper uh, yeah. back in the 50s. Yeah. And since then, uh, it was a brilliant paper, wonderful paper. Since then, the pace of technology has tremendously leapfrogged. Uh, you yeah. have the Moore, Moore's law describing that. Uh, yeah. So I was just wondering, um, how does the pace of technology fit into all this? I mean, we did talk about technology. We did talk about uh, gadgets uh, and preferences. But what does if what if anything 
has the pace of technology uh, to do with these models or with these uh, change in preferences or anything? Does it have any effect at all? And uh, one last thing, which is related to this thing, uh, since you've been studying all these uh, uh, preferences and, uh, and I found it very interesting when you talked about uh, uh, gauging preferences out of text. Um, yeah. So have you noticed any uh, difference uh, when it comes to geographical bifurcation of uh, preferences, for example, urban versus rural, or agriculture towns versus industrial towns. Have you noticed any bifurcation or difference in uh, preferences coming out of it? Um, okay, the, the, on the on the first point, I think um, the pace of technology. In fact, it does relate um, back to the the, the previous question. Um, I think what we see increasingly is, as you can see, in in um, in markets where um, you know preferences are interconnected, we do tend to get much more winner-take-all outcomes, and that's certainly what we've seen with you know companies like you know Google and Facebook, etc., and Amazon. You do get winner-take-all um much more so but they're constantly on to challenge you know at some point they will fail and other people will replace them at some unpredictable point uh, so there is this um i think the pace of technology means it, it is self-reinforcing but i think another a, a, a point to follow from this and this is something that say someone like brian arthur has worked on uh, at santa fe for, for we've known paulo alto for for many years and emphasizing um it's not necessarily um the best the objectively best technology uh that wins out as long as the if you to use simon's phrase as long as the technology is satisfactory as long as the offer of a company is satisfactory um getting um an early lead um is an important way in which you might eventually dominate and, and move towards that winner take all and i think going back i think in in terms of the way new industries arrive in new offers, new products. Um, I think it does have um, important implications for marketing strategy because all the mathematics of this, and this goes back to um, one of Arthur's papers in the 1980s um, and, be, and before, um, that getting an early lead um, is a very important way in which you might then self-reinforce in, in a copying world. Um, and actually then you know then then eliminate rivals that way so if you've got a new idea the key thing is to get it to market uh, and to judge your action and try and get sales try and get traction for it uh, you know rather than spend a long time trying to perfect it you know get it out there uh, and get people attached to it so I think there are important um, uh, if you like uh, implications practical implications about the pace of technology um, on the question of geography, I'm afraid we've not we've not done um, a huge amount about this. So we did look. Um, see, originally I'm from I've lived in London for many years. Um, I'm from the north of England, from uh, a place uh, near Manchester, which is actually quite a poor town. It's a former industrial town, and uh, in British terms, many many towns such as that have, have rather been left out. Um, the, the, they, they've fallen behind. Uh, and we did do the measure, the same exercise um, for that town. And rather to our surprise, we find that on average, although the, the, the fluctuations by, you know, do mirror, uh, they're not completely the same, but they're very similar to those experienced in London. Uh, but somewhat to our surprise, on average, um, uh, people are rather more optimistic in the poor town uh, than they are in, 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 in London. But it wasn't, it's not. I wouldn't say it was significantly different, but I'm afraid that that's the only we, we haven't we haven't gone wider afield and looked at different countries or even you know the UK as a whole. We, our interests, for a variety of reasons, have just been uh, just been in London, so I can't really say any more about that. Uh, thanks, Paul, but that's uh, something very interesting. I hope uh, we get something more on this one. Uh, what you mentioned about uh, poor town having. Uh, being, being more optimistic. That would be something very uh, interesting to look at. Uh, we have another question, Imtiaz Bhatti. You can go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shahid Saab. Uh, Paul, uh, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. 
Um, regarding satisfying, uh, what I understand is the boundedly rational people uh, have no alternative but to satisfy. And uh, Herbert Simon was uh, fond of incrementalism as well. So these are related. So uh, satisfying, what I understand is when you are not able to optimize, you have to satisfy. Yes. So uh, does it also relate to another economic concept, which is the concept of second best? Now, second best. I mean, I, I just, I, I do remember, I, 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 this, is, this is something, um, I do remember reading as being told to read as an undergraduate, um, a paper by, I think it's Lipsy and Lancaster on theory of the second best. I don't know whether, I mean, I don't think people, people are probably not taught this anymore, um, but I think it was, it, was, it was in the 90s, it was published in the 1950s. Um, which actually is a very important paper because they 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 showed that see there's a presumption in economics I think it's you know, obviously it's borne out by empirical evidence that if we move if we move away from more planned economies to more market oriented ones outcomes in general uh, are better um, but they showed that if you're in a world in which all the conditions for perfect competition and general equilibrium were met except for two. Um, if, if, if there's only one condition that's not met, then you know, removing that constraint you know, would, would actually unequivocally improve things. But if there are two, they showed that removing one, which would take you closer to the, the conditions for general equilibrium, um, wouldn't necessarily, a priori, theoretically, uh, there's no presumption that that would improve things. But I think this is one of the papers, I think it's very heavily uh, cited in literature. I think it's rather disappeared, but I think it's rather uh, a very important article, you know, many years ahead of its time. And it, it is in fact linked to that, the idea that, you know, we may not, the idea that we, that we can optimize, we just try and, so I, this is why more generally, um, I take a much more, if you like, evolutionary approach to economics or to policy and say, let's try and see, let's try and find out, you know, what works, you know, rather than trying to design very detailed plans. And it's very, diff it's more difficult with public policy, but it seems to me an important principle to, to use this evolutionary approach and to try and test much more than we do, um, uh, rather than, I mean, in fact, I suppose economics, in some ways, I mean, another important development, which I didn't mention, um, is of course, you know, the random the use of randomized controlled trials, which I think has you know, led to you know, some very powerful insights. Um, and that's, if you like, a, a test and try, an evolutionary uh, way of, uh, uh, of looking at things, which is related. Uh, so that in a sense, in a, in a sort of complicated way, I mean, all these points are joining up. So economics is moving in that direction, I think, but I think we just need to do it a bit more explicitly. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. It was uh, a good presentation. Uh, my question is related to reveal preferences. That nowadays, yeah. the two big uh, uh, tech, uh, Google and Facebook's... Uh, okay, um, I'm starting my question that uh, nowadays, two big uh, tech giants are collecting data. Uh, they know uh, about preferences uh, more than ourselves. So uh, there is a centralization issue that uh, uh, without own consent, and there is also a censor... Uh, how can we can public because this is more important for the market uh, to affect and more about the, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to get the benefit of it. So how develop nation and the developed nations uh, going to public this data to get benefit of it because it's more important because we know about the market, uh, the sentiments and about all so my question is how uh, we can uh, public it in the future and what will be the uh, resistance from the public? Uh, Paul, did you get the question? I only got, I mean, it was a bit um, frustrating because I'd hear part of the sentence and missed the key point. So I, I didn't I didn't quite get that. Um, I think it was, it was more about uh, big firms, data firms like Google and uh, others uh, having a lot of access to data and preferences. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, there's, there's, there is um, an interesting, um, in fact, there's a, a physicist I know in, in Switzerland and his team, they've done a lot of work on this. There's a, there's a big literature on it and saying, how much information do you need 
in order to get essentially a complete map of an agent's preferences. Um, and there seem to be, you know, if like three regimes where if you just have a little bit, if you have a small amount of information, then, you know, essentially, you know, nothing. And then if you're a bit more, you know, quite a lot, but you don't need, this is, this is how companies like Facebook and Google succeed. Um, you don't need a huge amount of information about, a, about an individual to be able to get an almost complete map of their preferences. And I think although people feel this intuitively, I think policymakers have not really caught up with this. Um, that it's not it's not magic. It's a, you know it's scientifically in you know, a mathematically based result that even you know even quite partial information about an individual's preferences, you know, because they have so many other comparators. That's the point. They've got such a big database. They can find somebody with these characteristics, and it's more complex than that. Or say recommender systems. You know, you say you're looking for, for you, you look for so you these you know these you might like these films, these books. Um, the mathematics rapidly gets very hair raising, but it's based on the uh, same principle. And I think this is something which, let's say, policymakers in general and the public haven't really um, haven't haven't really grasped about. You know the need that this is a, I think, a, a, you know, a legitimate concern, you know, of public policy. Um, though, you know, what what to do about it? I'm not. I have to say, I'm not quite sure. I just know that um, it is possible for them to get, you know, very very accurate maps of individual preferences um, in the hands of private firms on the basis of, you know, incomplete data. But more sinisterly, um, you know, um, countries such as China. Are of course very able to do this with their internal population. Um, and going back to a previous question, maybe this is um, it's really um, the states which are using it, which are of more concern, should be of much more concern to uh, you know questions of, of democracy, because if Facebook and Google can do it um, for certain, you know, the Chinese uh, internal security services can do it and get a complete read. Uh, on what the people there are thinking and doing. So um, it is a it's a it's a major issue. The new technology has created, I say, a, a really serious problem for which we which we're we've only just begun to grapple with. Indeed, Paul, that's uh, one of the uh, major issues, if not the major issue, uh, individual privacy. Uh, how would that pan out in uh, in a world with, in which we are all surrounded by gadgets uh, all around? <laughs> So, no, and I agree. I agree. I think you know there are signs of this because there there is now more. There's now a, there's at least now discussion, certainly uh, in Europe, and I think to some extent in America, uh, there is discussion about how this might be done. It's now it has become an issue, um, whereas let's say five or six years ago, I don't think it was, and so people are now taking this issue seriously. So nobody's got a solution to it yet, but the fact if you start to talk about it. You know, then people will try different things, and I think you know a solution might be found. Um, so, in in that sense, we're moving on in a, in a positive way. But I think, as I say, from from my point of view, the much more serious one is the ability of um, of states to actually learn, you know, learn much, you know, to get complete information on individuals. Um, in fact, I saw there's a piece um, I read yesterday. Um, so I was surprised. It's something called the London Review of Books. Um, about how uh, in China, as uh, Communist Party members, they have to listen um, uh, to you know, number, quite a number of lectures of you know, uh, uh, the Chinese leader. Um, and now they are monitored um, when they're watching by an AI program developed uh, by the Chinese state, um, which monitors their facial expressions, you know, their, uh, as he touched the keyboard, their sort of tensions uh, and judges how sincerely uh, they've learned and followed the words of the leader. And so, you know, we think about, you know, those of you who read, you know, George Orwell's novel 1984 about a totalitarian future. Well, it's um, it's already happening in China with the new technology. Yes, uh, oh yes, indeed. Uh, in China, it, it it has been highlighted a lot what the Chinese are doing um, yeah. and how they are collecting intelligence upon their citizens, yeah. and uh, there are a lot of concerns. Meanwhile, Imtiaz Bhatti has another question. Uh, Imtiaz, 
please go ahead. Yeah, then thank you very much, uh, Shahid, giving me one chance once again. Uh, Paul, I have a different type of question. You may not have mentioned it because I joined late, but uh, uh, we can recall early 1940s and 50s when central banks were becoming uh, uh, a normal thing in the world. Yeah. And, uh, and at that time, when government's powers were being uh, delegated to central banks, uh, people were up in arms against that because those are the powers of fixing monetary policy. Uh, the government should be doing it, not the central banks and independent authority. So uh, in democracy, uh, government's uh, powers uh, get optimized, rationalized, uh, so that uh, no one has dictatorial powers. So in, in the current context, uh, we have fiscal councils. So beyond monetary policy, it's the fiscal policy that whose powers are being taken away from the governments. So you have uh, in UK, your budget office uh, and uh, congressional budget office in uh, US and uh, in European Union, it, it is being required for, from every country to set up a fiscal council. So what do you think uh, about this uh, notion that uh, it is the right of uh, the government, democratically elected government, to fix a fiscal policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis monetary policy or some technocrats should be doing it? Oh, no, I, 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 I think this is a, a, a very important question of political economy that uh, you're right. Certainly in, in the European Union, the idea is that um, you know, the technocrats um, you know, should fix policy. I think one of the problems with that is that, you know, the people react against it. So that we had, you know, Brexit in the UK and currently in Italy, which essentially has been run, but purely by technocrats for a number of years, they've been installed. And the uh, recent Italian general election as a result of, has, has elected, um, a far-right coalition, the most right-wing government in Europe since, uh, in Western Europe, since the Second World War. And so, you know, there are adverse consequences of trying to place it um, in the hands of technocrats. And I would say, look, we've got examples of, let me, let me just talk more specifically about central bank independence. This was very fashionable in the 1990s. And the Bank of England was made a formally independent uh, by a new government in 1997. Um, I don't, and, and they, they, I don't think there's any particular merit in that. That central banks until recently uh, were very complacent and they uh, and self-satisfied. They believed that they had created uh, low low inflation in the West, whereas I think this was due much more to structural factors, um, and in particular. It's really not just uh, since the late eighties, the Chinese entering the world economy, but also increasingly you know, India, um, which um, has opened up much more, as you know, more in, in the last 20 or 30 years. And so this essentially added, you know, like 2 billion people to the world labor supply. Um, and that itself you know, dampened the ability uh, to raise prices. I think that that was a, a structural factor which um, helped to keep prices down and helped to keep inflation um, low, uh, rather than any particular genius of central banks. And indeed, if we may, if I, if we if we look at the specific example of the UK, um, in in the last few years, the Bank of England has had an appalling record. It was only um, earlier this year, the start of this year that they were writing to banks um, saying they must prepare their systems for negative interest rates. Um, this was like in, in January and February of this year. And now, of course, interest rates are at four or five percent. I mean, they thought the problem of inflation had been solved, uh, whereas in fact, uh, in, it, was, it, was, it was coming back because we, we could trace it by looking at um, if you like the share of labor, wages and salaries, share of national income. Um, that had been falling for a number of years, but it started to rise slightly in America, in Britain, and other Western European countries, suggesting we were entering a different phase 
where you know it, that we it, we it was it was becoming harder to impose uh, close to zero inflation. But central banks have not distinguished themselves in in the West um, in recent years, um, and it's hard to think why you know there shouldn't be uh, you know more more uh, democratic influence over it. And that's a personal. This is not an, an economic theory point of view. Um, but I don't think their track record, the fact that they were independent, I don't think their track record warrants that. And certainly uh, organisations like the Bank of England have, in my view, uh, performed really rather badly um, and not well. And uh, they, they could hardly have done worse uh, than uh, have a certain amount of political influence over them. We don't have any more questions, so I'll just say uh, this uh, this was a wonderful wonderful session. Um, uh, we it was an honor and pleasure to have you with us. And in the future, uh, we look forward to even more uh, collaboration and more webinars with you. Uh, keep writing, uh, keep informing us. Uh, you've got some excellent uh, written material on this, and excellent, which is which makes for an excellent reading. I hope uh, we keep uh, seeing that from you. Uh, but till the next time, uh, uh, goodbye and uh, have a nice time. And thank well, you very so much. much for and, being and thanks for the you know for the for the excellent questions. You know they were you know, they were all you know they, they were sort of very wide ranging and penetrating. So I enjoyed um, having those questions, but we made to think about them. Thanks very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>